Right now, though, get your Bibles out and open up to the book of James. Open up to the book of James. James, one of the last books in the New Testament, if you're new to your Bible, uh, the book of James. And we are starting a brand new series called Life Tools. I am so excited to do this series with you. It is a great thing to have good tools for life. I don't know about you, but I love good tools. Uh, can I hear a ooh, ooh, ooh from the guys? I love good tools. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, good tools are amazing. Yeah, girls too loves good tools. I think Diana likes good tools. Uh, good tools. I love good tools. Why? Because I enjoy fixing things. I know Scott's over here. I went to his garage. Oh, my gosh. He has some good tools. Uh, incredible stuff. Good tools are amazing. I enjoy fixing things. I enjoy building things. I love making high-performance race motors. And to do that, you need good tools. And uh, if you don't have good tools, boy, I learned that the hard way back in junior high when I first started working on my motorcycle. I had some cheap tools, and there was a bolt I was trying to get off, and I pushed hard, and it just rounded the head of that bolt off. And if you think the bolt was hard to get off before it was rounded off, once the head's rounded off, boy, that's really hard. For those of you who know mechanics, boy, you got to drill that thing, put an easy out in it, and... It's just a hassle, and you quickly learn the value of having good tools. Good tools can make the job go swimmingly well, great success. Bad tools cause disasters. And in life, there are good tools, and there are bad tools. There are tools that will bring, just like it brought to my motorcycle that day, a lot of destruction, a lot of unnecessary work. There are tools that we will employ, if we don't have good tools, that will bring a lot of destruction and disaster into our life. And so we are going to begin this new series looking at some tools to be well-equipped to be men and women who live for the glory of God. Men and women who are good husbands, good wives, good friends, good business people, good in our neighborhoods, good in relationships, good tools to do life to the honor, praise, and glory of Jesus Christ. And so excited about this new series. One thing I learned very young as well is that good tools are expensive. It requires an investment. They don't come cheap. Bad tools, yeah, they're cheap. But good tools, no, they require an investment. I still have tools that I got when I was 20 years old. And here's the good thing about making an investment on good tools is they last a lifetime. They last a lifetime. And if you are, are willing to invest in good tools, they will last you through all your days. As a matter of fact, I have a nice toolbox in my garage that I hope to pass down to my kids when I'm long gone. And, and those tools will remain. Well, I think the same thing happens for us. They're expensive life tools. They're expensive. They don't come just cheap by doing nothing. But if you will focus, God says, hey, I've got some really good tools that I want you to use. And... They will last you a lifetime, and you will be able to pass them down to your kids and to your kids' kids. And so with that, uh, we're going to jump into this new series. And our first message and the first life tool that we're going to look at is what to do when you don't know what to do. Uh, how many times do you face a situation? You go, man, I don't know what to do. Uh, for me, it happens hourly. Uh, Happens all the time. Uh, what to do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> Ask someone is a good answer. That's a good thing. But here's what I've noticed. When you don't know what to do, even the small things can seem really big when we don't know what to do. Maybe you're in that spot right now going through something in, your, in life, and you're going, man, I don't know what to do. Life's looking messy. Life's looking confusing. I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do. 
What do you do when you don't know what to do? You know what some people do? Some people worry. Some people worry and they stress out and they get all, you know, just consumed with grief. Yeah, it's not a good tool. Some people just make a decision and hope it works out. They just fake it till they make it. Okay, well, I'm doing this. I'm going to start a new job. I'm going to start a new ministry. I'm going to get married. And they just make a decision and, and the results can be disastrous. Some people get paralyzed with fear. Some escape into a diversion, whether that be surfing or partying or going to the bar. They just escape into some avert diversion, hoping that the trial will just go away. Some people use the tool of just kind of pulling back. And their life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Life often brings us to the place where we simply don't know what to do. And fortunately, the Bible gives us some really good tools that we're going to look at. Some life tools so that we not only get through those trials when we don't know what to do, not just merely get through, not just merely survive, but we're tools to help us grow through those trials thrive through those trials, and increase to the glory of God as we go through those things. So with that, let's open up to James chapter 1, and uh, let's jump into this. We're going to read the first eight verses and then talk about a few things. James chapter 1, if you're there, say amen. Let's pray before we read. Lord, we realize that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, we pray that you would allow your word to do its work in our life right now, to give us the tools that we need to be equipped, to be complete that we might be the men and women you called us to be. Open our eyes that we might see. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. James 1.1, 1, 1, here we go. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Yeah, James stops here. Short little introduction. Man, a few words. Right to the point he goes right after this. That's all we get about James right there. And it's interesting uh, who James is. This James, you know who he was? He was the half-brother of Jesus. Half-brother? What do you mean half-brother? Well, biologically, he was in the same family. James, his mother was Mary, just like Jesus' mother was Mary. But James' father was Joseph. Jesus' father, God. James' father, Joseph. So I say half-brother. But this is Jesus' biological brother. It's crazy. Imagine that. Imagine growing up with Jesus. James grew up with Jesus. Lived his life with them, grew up together. And the Bible tells us James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after his resurrection. Until after his resurrection that we celebrated last Sunday. Oh, when James saw Jesus die on the cross. When James heard him say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. When James saw the compassion and who is, and he realized, oh my gosh. And then when James saw him rise from the grave, James changed. And imagine the remorse that James had going through life, his whole life, not believing his brother was who he said he was. And now going, seeing him resurrected from the grave and going, oh my gosh, what was I doing? How I would like to go back and do that over. James is the uh, first book written in the New Testament. 
written in 49 AD. So we're only just a few years after Jesus' crucifixion, about 16 years after Jesus' crucifixion, this book is written. And you'll notice that James, he takes a humble position. Uh, He says, James, uh, look what he says, a bondservant of God and a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, James, the brother of the Messiah, the brother, the one and only brother of the true and living God, that's me. No, he doesn't do that. He says, James, a bondservant of God. A bondservant was an interesting term. It means a servant by choice. In Jewish law, if you owed money to someone, slavery was different uh, back in biblical days than than we have an an understanding of it in our day. In biblical days, if you got in trouble and you couldn't pay your bills and you owed someone a lot of money, uh, you, you couldn't declare bankruptcy. If you couldn't pay, you would become that person's servant. You would become that person's slave. And you would work for them for six years. On the seventh year, you were released. You were free. Your debt has been paid. And on the seventh year, you were free. But if you really enjoyed your master, if your master was a a good person to work for, that seventh year could come along and you'd say, you know what, I don't want to go out. I've got a nice place to live here with you. You treat me well. My life's going well. I've got a wife and kids with you here. You would then become a bond slave. And a bond slave simply meant a servant by choice. And to show that you were a servant by choice, you would take your ear and go to the the door of the house and you would pierce your ear to the door of the house, run it all through it into the door, And it would be symbolic of, I am a slave by choice. You'd wear an earring for the rest of your life, and it would say, uh, I'm an MTV rapper. No, it wouldn't say that. It It would say, I'm a servant by choice. I'm a servant by choice. MTV, do they even have MTV anymore? Crying out loud, that was like, you can tell I'm old. Uh. A servant by choice. I'm not a slave by force. I'm a servant by choice. And James here says, that's how he chooses to describe himself. I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Oh, I didn't believe him for a lot of years. I rejected him. I, I, I gave him a hard time. I used to hassle him and say, hey, come on, Messiah. If you're the Messiah, come on down. It's 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 Passover this week. Uh, come on down to the show everybody who you are, brother. <laughs> the Bible says the prophet is not without honor except in his own home. And here we see some of James' life and what he went through. And look what he says now. He doesn't say, hey, uh, I'm the brother of God. He says, I'm a bondservant of God. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 15 says James was a very, very devout man, really uh, you know, had a deep love for the Lord. He became the the leader in the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' death, left Judaism and became a leader in the church of Jerusalem. And and look what he he says here. He says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and I'm writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, yet to the Jewish Christians who, who had begun already to be persecuted at the stoning of Stephen, Uh, Jewish persecution began to arise, and now the Jews who believed in Jesus were getting scattered all over the earth. Why? Well, because that was God's plan. He didn't want all the Christians staying there in Jerusalem. They scattered throughout all the earth, and the gospel started spreading. But it gives you an idea of where we're going. It was spreading because they were being persecuted. There's there's trials, and so he wants to talk to us about that. Let's look at verse 2. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Notice the word when. He doesn't say, count it all joy if you ever have a trial. He says, no, you're going to have trials. You're going to have trials. Good to see Dave here today. Just 
I know he had a trial, was in a hospital last week. Dave, welcome back. Glad you're here. Yeah, it's not if you're going to have trials, it's when you're going to have trials. And uh, right now I'm going to ask you to do something that won't make sense now, but it will make sense as we get through this. I want you to circle the word count. Count. Count it all joys, not if, when you fall into various trials. Yeah, it's a tough world. This isn't heaven. We're going to face problems. And uh, sometimes we think, you know, oh, I'm a Christian now. How come I'm having troubles? Because you live in a fallen world. Because you have a sin nature to deal with. Because other people have a sinful nature. This is not heaven, church. It's wrong to have the mindset that this is going to be heaven. And one of the tools that we need to have is just to know that, hey, we're temporary We're pilgrims. We're going through this world. We're preparing ourselves to meet God. This world is a tough world. You're going to have problems. Verse 3. But know this. I want you to circle this word, know. Know that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let, I want you to circle the word let. You should have three words circled right now. What are they? All right. Count, know, and let. Let patience have its perfect work, that you might be perfect. The word there meaning mature, perfect, mature, complete, lacking nothing. Yeah, that's the work the Lord wants to do in our life. If any of you lacks wisdom, do you lack wisdom? I do. Uh, Any of you lack wisdom to parent? If you lack wisdom to be happy, If you lack wisdom to be married, if you lack wisdom to enjoy life, if you lack wisdom when you're going through a trial, if you lack wisdom to be effective in the ministry that God's called you to, if you lack wisdom to deal with a a vicious enemy who wants to hurt you, if you lack wisdom to know how to handle a brother or a sister who has broke your heart, If you lack wisdom to know how to go through a financial problem, look what it says. If any of you lacks wisdom for any of these things, let him ask of God. Next word I want you to circle is ask. That'll be all the words. Count, know, let, and ask. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. Freely, in other words. And without reproach, and it will be given to him. Yeah, underline it will. It will be given to him. If you ask, it will be given to him. Jesus said, everyone who asks receives. If you ask, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Maybe you're here this morning and your life kind of looks like that. You are like a wave driven by the sea. Turbulent waters. Blown this way. Blown this way. You start saying, okay, I'm going to go this direction. I'm going to do this. And then next thing you know, you're way over here. You go, what happened? Oh, life just blew me over here. Now I'm doing this. Hey, I thought you were doing that. Well, I was, but now I'm doing this. Now you're doing this. And now get blown over here and you're blown, tossed to and fro. Verse 7 says, Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We have some stuff to unpack. And I want to bring these tools that James is giving us. James is a hard-hitting guy. He pulls no punches. He tells it like it is. And here he's given us some tools that are really good for us to hold on to. The first one, the first thing that you circled was the word what? Count. And the first thing he tells us, the first tool that we want to have, is that we want to count it all joy when we face these various trials in life. Count it all joy. What? Not the natural reaction we would normally have. Hey, I don't know what to do right now. What should I do? I don't know what to do. Hey, count it joy that you don't know what to do. What, are you crazy? No, I'd much rather know what to do. 
But James is giving us a tool, an important tool, a valuable tool, a tool that will serve us really well to be successful when we're facing an issue where we don't know what to do. And the first thing he tells us is count it joy. Or in other words, have a positive mindset. Desiring to learn, desiring to grow, desiring to glorify God. Have a positive mindset that wants to learn and experience and, and, and grow in what God is doing in this situation in your life. Now, when he says count it all joy, the word count is an accounting term. The same word, interestingly enough, the Greek word, if you get a Greek lexicon out, that word is translated elsewhere in your New Testament as the word govern. Govern. It's an accounting term. It means to accredit or rule over something. And what he's saying is, I want you to have this mindset. I want you to govern your mind. I want you to put yourself in a spot where you have a positive mindset that says, hey, yeah, I'm in a spot that I don't, wanna, I don't know what to do, but I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to allow this to have a good work in my life so that I can become what God wants me to become, and I can glorify God. Now, what it, what it does not mean, count it all joy, it, it's not a, a Pollyanna optimism that is just, oh, I'm so happy, I lost my job, but it's okay. It'll be fine. That's not what it is at all. It's not pretending. It's not putting on a happy face. That is a falsehood. That is pretense. And if you know anything about Jesus, if you know anything about the Bible, one thing God despises is pretense. God loves a pure heart. He never says, oh, just put on a happy face and act like everything's okay. No, 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 not what it means. What does it mean then? count it all joy well it means have the mindset that says hey lord i'm going to believe you i know you're doing a work in this right now i know i've got this strained relationship with someone really important to me but i'm going to believe you're working i know i've lost my job right now and i don't know how i'm going to provide for my family and i'm really concerned about it but i know that in this, you're going to do a work. That you're going to show me some things. Hey, I know that I've made a mess of my life with drugs and with alcohol, but I know this, you've got me on the right path, and my eyes are on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking forward to how you're going to build me and grow me and change me. Have a positive mindset that says, Lord, I want to learn, I want to know, I want to grow, I want to glorify you in all that you're doing in my life. And I want you to know that's not our normal reaction, is it? When we face something that's hard, something that's difficult, something that we don't know what to do, our normal reaction is just to go, ah! And what happens when we do that? Here's what happens. James is telling us, hey, beware of having a myopic focus on your problem. Where all you're seeing is your problem. And when you face a situation and you don't know what to do, when you're facing hardship, hey, don't just get a myopic focus on what your problem is. Instead, take a step back and have a higher position that you're looking at it at. Count it all joy, knowing that this is going to be used in your life. God is going to grow you. Hold a perspective that's higher than your actual problem. When I was younger, I used to race motocross. And I remember when I would go out riding, sometimes it would rain, and there'd be like a, uh, this downhill section, and, and there'd be these giant ruts that came from the erosion, or sometimes just ruts from the other bike. And... 
what would happen is you're going down this, and of course you're trying to go as fast as you can, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going really fast down this section, and there's this giant drainage rut that has happened from, you know, all the rain. And you see that thing, and you think, oh, I don't want to hit that rut. Don't want to hit that rut. And here's what I learned. If you focus on the rut, guess what happens? Next thing you know, sure enough, <laughs> disastrous. And you have to remember to look at the bigger picture and not overfocus on the rut and just stay your course. The danger of focusing on our problems is that for sure it will cause us to just go right into our problems. And James is giving us a good tool. He says, hey, know this. Look what he says, verse 3. Know this, that the testing of your faith is going to produce something in your life. That what you're going through has a purpose. This issue that you're facing, this hardship that you're going through, it has a purpose in your life. It's going to perfect us. You see, we need to know this, that life is God's instrument. Life is the instrument God uses to mold us, to shape us, and to change us, and to grow us into the image of Jesus Christ. May I remind you this morning that we are not accidents. Just going through life randomly. We are not orphans just going through life alone, trying to figure it out. No, if you are a Christian, you have a heavenly father, and he is a good father. And you know what he is doing in your life? He is parenting you. He is parenting you. And you know what you need? You know what I need? You know what we need? We need some good parenting because we need to grow up. We need to grow up. Some people grow old and they don't grow up. That is a shame. Some people don't have the tools they need to do life right. And, 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 and God says, hey, no, 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 I'm a good father. I want to provide some good tools in your life. And so James is giving us a good tool here, his first tool. He says, hey, have a positive mindset. Face your dilemmas with optimism, knowing that God is at work in your life. And it's a good work that he's doing. It's a necessary work that he's doing. You, this isn't just random hardship you're going through. This is for a purpose. This is a good work. It's a necessary work. And you say, well, hey, if God's trying to show me something, then why the trial? Why not just teach me? Why not just say, hey, here's what I want you to know. Well, he does. God has a, a lot of ways of parenting us. And he parents us in various ways. What are the ways God, God parents us, church? How does he parent us? Number one, the number one way he parents us is through his, his word. His word. Yeah, he parents us through our word. Hey, look, all kinds of instruction, everything you need to know. All scripture given by inspiration of God, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yeah, right there, the word. Parents us through his word. He does. He does. Another way he parents us is by our conscience. He'll speak to our conscience. Hey, 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 shouldn't do that. Rachel, shouldn't do that. Don't want to go that direction. Don't want to go there. Kevin, hey, hey, hey. He speaks to our conscience. Parents us through the word. Parents us through our conscience. Parents us through his Holy Spirit, kind of convicting us. Hey, what did you say to your wife? Well, she made me really mad. I mean, hey, what did you say to your wife? That small, still voice that speaks to our heart, speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. Parents us through the word, parents us through our conscience, parents us through the Holy Spirit, leading, guiding, and directing us into all truth. The Holy Spirit pointing us to Jesus and, and having us do life like Jesus did life. He also speaks to us through our family, our church family. It's why we meet in groups. It's why we fellowship. It's why we have mission groups through the week. Because through my brothers and sisters in Christ, God speaks to me. I learn things. He, he guides me. 
but he also parents us through trials. Through trials. Why trials? Well, here's why. Because I have found, maybe you have too, that trials reveal things to me in 3D. Trials reveal things to me in living color. Trials reveal things to me in a full-scale situation where I can go, oh, man, with crystal clarity, I now understand. Trials reveal things differently than, than all the other parenting methods that we just discussed. Let me illustrate it for you. God speaks to us through his word, and he says, hey, you should trust in me. And so one of the first verses we all memorize as Christians, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is, if you know it, say it. Trust in the Lord. Say it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Great verse. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse 7 goes on to say, Hey, we all learn that when we're brand new Christians. If you haven't learned it yet, learn it. Yeah, it's a good one. What do we learn? What do we read? The Bible says, trust in the Lord. And we go, okay, yes, yes, I love that verse. Memorized it. Trust in the Lord. I trust you, Lord. Woo, I trust you. And so intellectually, we agree. We say, yes, Lord, I trust you. And then we go to our church family. Someone sharing their problem that they have. Hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm going through this. And what do we say? As we counsel them, we pat them on the back and we say, hey, just trust God. Just trust God. And so we take what we learn in the word and we now in our family just trust God. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God and call to go to prayer. It's going to work out good. Trust. And then we pray. God speaks to us through the word. God speaks to us through the church family. God speaks to us as we pray to him, to our conscience. We pray, we pray, we say, Lord, help me trust you today. Help me to live by faith. And we go out our day and we believe we are trusting God. We memorize Proverbs 3, 5. Yeah, I'm trusting God. I talked about it in my mission group and I prayed it today. Yeah, I'm trusting God. And then a trial comes. We lose our job. Our financial future, our financial security is in mega trouble. And what do we do? We freak out. And those little verses come back to us. Trust in the Lord. And we go, I can't. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. I don't know how I'm going to. And we freak out. And now in full color, in 3D, I see just how much I trust money. I see just how much I trust my own ability. And I see, wow, I don't really trust the Lord as I thought I did. And so trials then show me new things. Trials then perfect us and guide us and build in us. And what Jesus is doing, that word perfect, it means complete. It means to be mature. God is building us to maturity in every aspect of our life. He wants our mind to be mature, that we would have right thinking when we face a problem, when we don't know what to do. We'd have right thinking. He wants to make us perfect or complete or, or mature in our character, that we would have right behavior when we don't know what to do. And he wants to make us mature or perfect or complete in our soul, in our heart, that we would be at peace even when we're going through difficult times. And you know what happens? Then our life glorifies Jesus as God wants it to, as he intends to. And so as Christians, how refreshing it is for us to know that when we go through a trial, the trial's not in vain. It has a purpose. And that's why he says that first word, Count it all joy. Know this, that, hey, this isn't just some random thing. This trial has a purpose in your life. They are the instruments God is using to parent us, to perfect us, to make us complete and so that we're lacking nothing. And he says, hey, count that and know that. Know that that's what he does. Have you noticed that some parents, some parents parent in a way 
that they want to shield their kids from going through every trial or hardship. They try to protect their kids from those things. What happens if you protect your child from every trial and hardship? What happens? You have some miserable kids. You have some kids that are selfish, that are inadequate, that are ill-equipped for life, that are lacking character, and you cannot shield them from everything. And here as Christians, it's good to know that our Heavenly Father says, look, I'm not going to shield you from everything and make you a spoiled kid. I'm going to allow some things to come into your life to grow you, to build you, to give you good tools. And I'm so encouraged by that. We can have joy knowing that our trials are doing this work in our life, that they're father-filtered. They haven't come to me by accident. They've been father-filtered to produce a good work in my life. And I tell you what, life would be futile without knowing that God was doing that work. If you're not in Christ, you're just going through trials for no reason. You might as well eat, drink, and, and, and party, for tomorrow we die. And that's why the world, when they go through trials, where, where do they go? They don't go to God, they go to the bottle. Let me, just take, let, me just, let me just intoxicate myself so I don't have to think about this. But as Christians, we have some real confidence knowing that, hey, these trials have a purpose. And when we don't know what to do, this is God's work in our life. He is growing us. He is building us. It's this, this difficulty is not just to ruin my life. No, it's actually to do something great. God is doing a perfecting work in us. A gradual process of adding virtue upon virtue until we're not lacking anything, until we're mature in Christ, not blown around by the storms of life. And then you know what happens when that happens? This is so cool. Our faith becomes complete. Our faith becomes complete, or our faith becomes perfect, or our faith becomes mature in the fullest sense. We're ready to stand before Jesus at the Bema Seat Judgment to say, Lord, here I am. I, I live my life for you. Ready to serve Jesus in his kingdom, and that's faith's goal. And so we can count it all joy. We can have a positive mindset. We can know for sure that, hey, what we're going through has a purpose. The second tool he gives us is in verse 5, and it's really simple. It's just simply ask God for wisdom. When you don't know what to do, number one, have a positive mindset, know God's working. And number two, ask God, hey, God, what do you want me to do? And James tells us here in verse 5, he says, hey, God gives to you liberally and without finding fault. He does liberally. What does that mean? It means, it means he gives freely, abundantly. He doesn't give stingily. He's going to give you an abundance. Lord, I need a socket to get this bolt off, and it's really hard. God says, hey, I'll give you liberally. I'm not just going to give you one socket. I'm going to give you a whole set. I'm going to give you an, a, a hyperabundance of all that you need. He gives liberally. Second thing he says, he gives liberally a, a, a whole set, not only that, but without finding fault. I love that about God. Lord, I need help. You know what? He never comes to me and says, Dave, what do you need help with that for? Don't you know that by now? I can't believe you're asking for help on that. That is so remedial. What is wrong with you? Sometimes I help people that way. It's shameful. Well, especially my kids. Hey, you really should know this by now. No, God doesn't do that. God says he, he, he gives liberally and without finding fault. God is a good father. I know you know this, but let it sink into your heart. Say the words with me. God is a good father. Say that with me. God is a good father. Maybe you didn't have a good father. Maybe you had an absentee father. Maybe, like my house, my dad was never even there when I was born. Maybe you don't know what a good father is. Hey, I want you to know God is a good, good father. And as you grow to know him, you're going to be blown away. And he just loves to do life with you. And his instruction, it's real simple. Hey, when you don't know what to do, hey, just ask me. I want to be in your life. I love it when my kids ask me to do things with them. My son Nathan came to me the other day. He's got this 
nice little car, you know, it's a little Toyota something, I don't know what it is, um, a Scion, actually, uh, and uh, he had sap all over his windshield, and he goes, Dad, I tried getting this off, and it smeared every, how do I get this stuff off my windshield? Hey, glad you asked. Stopped what I was doing, went outside with them, got some chemicals that took it off like that, that didn't ruin the car, and just love doing life with him. My son Jordan called me this week and said, Dad, he's got a start at business he's doing, and it's been going really well, and he hit his first really big problem. His deal fell apart, and he had already counted his chickens before they hatched. He needed that money, and, and oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have this money. And I just loved it. I just my, my son coming to me, hey, Dad, what do I do? And we talked about it, and we looked at it and prayed on it. And, and you know what? I love it when my kids come to me and say, hey, Dad, what do I do? And you know what the Bible tells us? God loves it. God loves that. Ask. It will be given to you. Press down and flowing over just in a hyperabundance, not stingy giving, but just a hyperabundance. On your screens, Matthew 7, 7. Let me hear you read this out loud. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. You know what God is telling us? You know what Jesus is saying? Ask me for wisdom. I will give it to you. Loves to give it. King David was a man after God's own heart. He knew God. He asked God, God, I want you to reveal yourself to me. And David knew God. God himself called David a man after my own heart. What a, what a privilege and title. Oh, my gosh. And God blessed David with an abundance of wisdom. And he established the kingdom of Israel. And it was the the ruling nation over all the earth. He brought Israel to its zenith with his son Solomon. And David used God, excuse me, God used David in powerful ways because David loved God. He just wanted to do life with him. And then David died. And imagine you that you're a young Solomon. And now you've got to fill your father's footsteps. Solomon was in a position where he said, I don't know what to do. And what did Solomon do? Solomon do when he didn't know what to do? What did he do? He asked God. What did he ask God for? Wisdom. Wisdom. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Ask God for wisdom. And he came before God, and very humbly he simply said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead all these people. I don't know how to come in, and I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to be. And he just asked. And God gave him an abundance of wisdom. God was pleased that he asked. And God said, hey, you've asked for wisdom. You've asked wisely. I'm going to give you wisdom. Not only that, I'm going to give you everything else also. Why? Because he gives liberally. He gives generously. He doesn't just give you that one socket. He gives you the whole toolbox. And that's what he loves to do. And that's not an isolated case. We could talk about all kinds of people in the Bible who did the same thing. I look at Joshua. Moses dies. Moses was an amazing leader, brought the people, children of Israel out of Egypt, led them to the, uh, you know, into the promised land, led them for 40 years, was an amazing leader, parted the Red Sea. How do you follow that kind of leader? Those are big shoes to fill. And when Moses died, God taps Joshua on the shoulder and says, you're up. And Joshua says, I don't know what to do. And God comes and says, Joshua, here's what you do. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. For you should meditate it in it day and night. That you might learn to do according to everything that's written in it. And then you're going to make your way prosperous, and then you're going to have good success. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. 
I'll be with you wherever you go. And then he tells Joshua, think about how good these words were. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. That wasn't Moses leading the people. That was me leading the people. And just like I was with Moses, I was with you. Hey, what's my point? Ask. Ask. Simply ask. God wants us to ask. He loves it when we ask. And maybe you say, man, I can't ask God. I've got too much sin in my life. I am too wicked. I've sinned too much to ask God for wisdom. I want you to write this down if you're in that position. I want you to write down a Bible verse that I want you to read just one chapter later. Not now, later. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. It's in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. If you think that you can't ask God because your life's too messy, I want you to read 2 Chronicles chapter 33. In a summary, here it is. There's a king, king of Israel. His name is Manasseh, and he was a wicked king. I guarantee you, your life is not as wicked as his. Manasseh worshipped every god under the sun except the true and living God. He was set up asterisk poles to have sex, uh, worshipping the sex god, the fertility god. And on all the high places of Israel, he led the people astray, away from the living God. And they would go up to these places and just worship sexual immorality. He worshipped Moloch, the god of materialism. They had all kinds of unwanted pregnancies. So guess what they did with their unwanted pregnancies? Same thing we do with them today. They got rid of their unwanted pregnancies. They burned their babies on the arms of Moloch. They offered child sacrifices. All spearheaded by King Manasseh. King Manasseh was a wicked dude. He worshipped sex, drugs, wealth. He promoted idolatry and sorcery. You think that's bad. No, he even did something worse. He did, we, he put an idol in the temple of God and erected an idol in the holy place of the temple. That's a huge abomination against God. And you know what God did? God brought in the king of Assyria who took Manasseh and literally put a hook in his nose, a fish hook in his nose and led him away with a hook in his nose on a rope, on a chain, and led him captive into Babylon. And there in captivity, guess what wicked king Manasseh did? He repented. He said, Lord, I've been a fool. I've led the nation into destruction. I would not listen or learn any of your tools. And now I have ruined everything. And to your amazement, to my amazement, you know what God did? He asked, and God gave. God took him out of captivity and restored him as king. And Manasseh went back in, and he tore down all the idols that he put up, all the gods of sex, money, and rock and roll. And he led the nation back to the, the living God. My point is simply this. I don't care what you've done. Ask. Here's why. Because God loves to heal. God loves to give. God loves to restore. I can tell you in my life, I ask all the time. I remember 27 years ago, I was a brand new Christian, and my wife was nine months pregnant. And I never had a dad in my life uh, that, that was really, well, I don't want to say that the wrong way. My dad was not active in my life. He did not raise me. And now I found myself, a brand new Christian, I'm going, oh my gosh, I am not equipped about what's going to happen. My wife's pregnant. You know what I did? Lord, I need wisdom. How do I be a dad? What do I do? I don't know if I can be, I don't know how to be a dad. I've never seen, I need wisdom and god poured wisdom that's what he loves to do ask god loves to give you wisdom i tell you as a man i ask all the time as a pastor i ask all the time lord give me wisdom but notice what he says here verse six notice what he says when you ask he puts a caveat on it what does verse six say let him ask in 
faith, not doubting. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Don't let that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. What does that mean? Here we learn that we have to ask God properly, in faith, without doubting. Doubting doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean, oh, I've lost my job, and I just believe everything's going to work out okay. I just believe, 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 believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Positive confession, believe, believe, believe. It's not what it means. It's not what it means. It means, when it says no doubting, it doesn't mean that you can't doubt like, oh, man, this is me. I don't know how it's going to work out. That's okay. Not doubting means this. It means not wavering. It means not leaving your post. It means not shifting gears and going a different direction. It means not going to something else for help instead of God. It means that you hold your post. You remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were being thrown into the fiery furnace? Because they wouldn't bow their knees and and pray before the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up? And they were brought before the fiery furnace. Their life was about to come to an end. Nebuchadnezzar says, I'll give you one more chance. You bow your knee. And he said, they said, hey, we don't even need to pray about this. We already know we're not bowing to to some statue. Because we know that God is the true and living God. And he is able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not bowing because we'll stand before him. Yeah, they didn't know how it was going to work out. They doubted how it was going to work out, but they did not waver in their position. They were unwilling to waver in their position. No matter how it works out, we're not moving. And that's what it's saying. It's saying, hey, we have to ask in faith. That's what it means to ask in faith. That's what it means to ask properly. When we ask for wisdom, we have to ask properly in Jesus' name, according to God's person, according to his nature not wavering to something else. God, help me, help me. And then, oh, never mind, I think this person will help me. And we waver. We leave that. The Bible says, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because God doesn't want to give it? No, because we quit asking. We've gone to something else. And so important that we hold on to the purpose of what we're asking for, staying focused on what he's called us to. God is going to build us over time. When we face these trials, we don't get fixed instantly. We don't get wisdom instantly. God's wisdom doesn't come just like that. He builds it in us through life over time. How are we going to receive from God? We have to hold our course. We have to stay our position. Staying focused on the work that he wants to do in our life. We have to keep the main thing the main thing. We have to have a singular focus. If you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they do? They had a single focus. They stayed focused on what, on what they knew to be right. They said, God, we want, we want to just do this your way. You know what I've learned? Most of us have spiritual ADD. We all know what ADD is, right? What does ADD stand for? Attention Deficit Disorder. You know what I've learned, what I've realized? Most of us have spiritual ADD. Spiritual Attention Deficit Disorder. We go through a trial, and we realize something. God shows us something. Wow, I'm a control freak. I need to change. This trial showed me this. And so we pray. Lord, help me not to be a control freak. Boy, I really realize that I really damaged this relationship by being a control freak. Oh, man, Lord, I'm sorry. We pray, Lord, help me not to be a control freak. We ask God for wisdom. But then what do we do? Two days go by, and what happens? We forget all about it, right? We forget all about what we ask God for. We have spiritual ADD. Imagine imagine being in a race. Uh, You're running a 10K. You're running a 10K, and there you get to, I don't know how far 10K is, but you're running a 10K. There you get to 8K, however far that is. And your ADD kicks in. 
And you go, I'd really like a Starbucks. I'm running by Lofty Coffee. Oh, it's my favorite coffee shop. I love Lofty Coffee. And you pull out of the race to go into Lofty Coffee. You have runner's ADD. And now you've, you sit there for a couple hours, and you start to, and you go, oh, I forgot I was in a race. That's exactly what happens to us in our walk with God. God gives us a trial. We cry out for wisdom. God says, great, that's what I was hoping you'd ask. Now I want to start building you. Now I want to start growing you. And what do we do? Our spiritual ADD kicks in, and we forget all about what we ever asked God for. And God says, hey, let that, that man not, not, he won't receive anything. He's double-minded, James says. He did not stay focused on the work I wanted to do in his life. He asked me for tools. I brought the tool truck, and he wanted something else. Double-minded. Let's wrap up. Look at verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom to do this relationship, to be married, to be a great parent, to be a builder of God's kingdom, let him ask of God. He'll give it to you freely, liberally, in abundance, and he'll give it without reproach. He's not going to say, how come you don't know this? It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting not wavering from his position, hold your post. Because if you don't hold your post, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord, not because God doesn't want to give it, but because you're not there to receive it. You've already forgotten. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It's, It's sad to have spiritual ADD. Take the acronym spiritual ADD, and what does it spell? Spiritual ADD. Sad. It's sad. We won't grow. To grow, we must be aware of our spiritual ADD. And say, Lord, I know I'm prone to leave and to go after other things. Lord, I want to stay focused on obeying you. I want to stay focused on what you're calling me to. And we do that through prayer. That's the purpose of prayer. I hope you have a prayer journal so you can remember what you asked God for last week. And as God starts to bring that into your life, say you're a control freak. God, I need some good tools. I'm a control freak. It's a bad tool. I need some good tools. Help me, Lord. Guess what God does? He stops the universe. He redirects it and says, okay, I'm going to start bringing some things into your life to help you with that. And now, all the universe is spinning a different way, and he's starting to bring that to me, and I'm off on lofty coffee now. I've totally forgotten what God's calling me to. And so, he says, hey, through a prayer journal, you can stay focused. Have an accountability partner, someone you talk to. I've noticed that we come to God, and we ask for wisdom, and you know what we want as Christians? We want God to zap it to us. Zap! Here's wisdom doesn't work that way. Just know that it doesn't work that way. God wants to do a relationship with us, and he builds it in us over time. Will you stand with me?